For those of you who um, attend these Zoom camp meetings, know that I normally have my Zoom, uh, sorry, my chat off. Um, but I've left it on this time. And you please not use the chat. Except if I ask a specific question. I'll let you know to put your answers in the chat and then I'll tell people to stop putting answers when I receive sufficient. I want to thank you for your cooperation. I'm really happy to meet with you all again. Um, with all that, let's open with a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for your continued watch care and protection over us. We live in interesting times as we wrestle between being observers of prophecy and participants, having the ability to move and change prophecy. As each of us individually and corporately make decisions for time and for eternity that affect us individually, our households, and the world. May the prayer of each of us be that you grant us not only understanding, but wisdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. As I was preparing um, for this camp meeting, I ended up getting into a discussion with the ministry leader in Canada. And the question related to aspects of the amendment, the US amendments. We had some dialogue back and forth. And we agreed that both myself and the ministry leader You will know her, it's Katia. Would end up speaking about the same subject. So 
So if there's any overlap between what I say and what she says, I think it's good. It's good to repeat things. But if we don't, then we're both talking about the same subject from a different perspective. So the subject relates to the Second Amendment. So I'm assuming that everybody knows what the Second Amendment is. In its most basic form, it's dealing with um, firearm or gun rights. So I'll just read the Second Amendment. I've posted it on the Zoom forum for those who need it. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, this is not a new subject. I've spoken about the Second Amendment several times over the last few years. We've spoken about it um, in great detail, I believe. And I hope that most of you, if not all of you, have an understanding of what my opinion is on the wording of the Second Amendment. So I'm going to read the amendment again, just so that we're familiar with it. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, it's a very short amendment and it may seem relatively straightforward. But as we all know, this amendment is contested by millions of people throughout the United States. So if we were doing a study on this, the first thing I would ask is for people to pick out the key words. So I want to do that now. And what I want to do, ask you to do is when you write your answer in the chat. Is that you have to restrict yourself to two words.
your task is to write the two most significant or important words in that amendment that you think are, are the ones that we should be dealing with. So we look, we're looking for the significant words and we're looking for two. So um, if you're looking at the chat, you can see that people have got many different answers. So we can stop there. The most popular choice seemed to be a regulated militia, regulated and militia. That seemed to be the popular one. So I'm going to go with militia as one of the correct words. Now, when I do a study like this, I always give my perspective. I don't want to make it appear that my perspective is always the correct one and the only right one. But I know it sounds like that. So I'm going to say that I don't think anybody gave me the correct second word. Except now. Very cheeky. People. So we don't have an opportunity to dialogue. It's all one way. I understand that. So the two key words that we wrestle with is militia and people. So I understand that you may not all agree with this. So the reason why it's these two points, depending on how the two groups, we normally call them the left and the right, the blue and the red, The reason why there's this contention is because both groups are going to focus on one word. If you're on the left, what color are you? In the chat? Blue. We'll go with that. So if you're on the left and you're blue, what's your key word? That you're going to develop your thesis on. Okay, so straight away, we've got a contention. Some people are saying militia and some people are saying uh, people. Some people are given different answers. It has to be one of these two words. So that's enough answers. 
Now, what I want us to do, we can only do it individually, is to try to think, why are we coming up with different answers? What this is indicating to me and to you is that as a body, as a movement, we do not agree upon the thinking, the logic and the thought processes, thinking, logic and thought processes. of the left, and therefore of the right. Because if I'd asked the same question, what's the important word for the right, which is the red, we would have got both answers. So this should be of concern to us. that we don't speak as a single voice. Because it's these two concepts which are, are undergirded by these two words that the argument centers around. And each of us needs to understand this. Now, we might call it methodology. We might call it logic. You might even get the right answer if you are widely read. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to make a huge point to say, to tell people off, to tell anybody off. It's, that's not what I want to do. But what I want us to see, when I ask yes or no questions, and we get mixed answers, Just say 50-50. Collectively, this should show us that we're not sure, we're not clear how to sift information Sift means to filter. And even if you, even if you didn't listen to the news, even if you weren't sure on some issues, we could call it logic or we could call it methodology, should be strong enough in our experience that it would carry us through to give the correct answer. So if I ask another question, which ideology, philosophy, cares about individual rights above everything? Good, we've got freedom, we've got right. What do we call it? What ideology do we call it? Good, we'll go with libertarianism. So libertarians are on the left or the right. 
they're on the right and they care about me. And they care about which rights. Corporate or individual. They don't care about their own rights. That's not the right answer. Someone said that. Good. They care about individual rights. That's the people, individuals. So the arguments that people are going to use on the left and the right People on the right focus on the word people. And therefore, the people on the left, they're interested in the word militia. So in these founding documents, When it says, we the people, by the people, of the people, those are not collective people, they are individuals. One person, one vote, the individual. So when people look at this amendment, the ones on the right with a libertarian leaning, they're going to focus on individual or people's rights. Whereas the people on the left They're going to say we're concerned more about the corporate influence or the corporate experience. So we can put it this way. Individual protection, corporate protection. I apologize. When I said individual, I'm pointing to people. When I said corporate, I pointed to militia. So I hope we're all on the same page now. And we're all and we're all in agreement. So once we can establish this and if you have been keeping pace with our conversation thus far you will have noticed that i've used several if i call it techniques um, of our standard methodology I've brought in a number of threads, number of pieces of logic to come to this conclusion. Either now, live, or as you review this study, I hope that you take time to note how we built up this, this position. Because up, up until this point, they will say in the last 30 minutes,
half of our movement who were attending were on the right, the far right, right wing, red libertarians. We'll call you closet libertarians. And you didn't even know it. So you, what you'll see is that, that this issue comes up over and over again. We think we're one thing, but the evidence shows us that we're something else. We all believe that the truth sets you free. And we only understand the truth by a correct understanding of the information. And we only secure that correct understanding through methodology. OK, so both sides are going to argue from a different perspective. Now, is there historical confusion or complexity? Of course there is. Were there people and were there militias in that history? For sure. Was all of this, were all these documents put together in a history that was saturated with warfare? For sure, the American Revolution has only just happened. And for the most part, especially at the beginning, that struggle was a struggle of a militia not a professional or what we would call a standing army. But we need to remember, and I always say this in a very simplistic fashion so that we can hopefully grasp the essence. United States, is it a country? Your answers? No answers, it's not a trick question. <laughs> okay, so let me ask a different question. Is the USSR a country? It's the same question, just a different context. And now we're all going to get the same answer. Good. So that was just methodology in play. Compare and contrast, juxtapose. So I go back to the question, is the United States a country? The answer is no.
So some people have called it a union. Which is fine because it's called the United. But I want to use the word um, federation. And someone has used the word confederation, which is obviously very similar. So I want to suggest that the Constitution. I'll ask the question, is the Constitution a state document or a federal document? Good. Everybody says it's the federal document. Correct. So next to the Constitution, there's another document. What's the document that's next to it? The Bill of Rights. So the Bill of Rights is a funny term the second amendment where is the second amendment found in the bill of rights good so the bill of rights is the first 10 amendments So when it says rights, whose rights are they talking about? Bill means law. So it's a law or a statement about rights. OK, what we have to remember. When you're learning or teaching. You have to use a technique, a method. It's something that we discussed and explored many years ago now. I used to call it threading. And we take a line with way marks, turn them into needles with eyes and thread something through the eye of the needle. Now, if I'm a bad teacher, if I would just throw random things at you. But a good teacher would create a thread or a sequence. So when I ask this question now, It's the same question that I asked before. So there's a federal document. And they didn't wait a few decades for the Civil War to write some amendments. They pulled it out of their back pocket straight away. They issued at the same time. And the second one they called our rights. Our rights against whom, if I can say it that way,
And before I asked, whose rights are they, are, is it talking about? So if one document's a federal one, what's the other one? If you're on the right, if you're right leaning, your answer would be what? The rights of? The people. The individual. If you're on the left, it's the rights of whom? Only got one choice. <laughs> Good. It's the right. I've got the word corporate, but in real life, if one of them is the right of the federation, it's the right of whom? Not everyone. It's the right of the state. All good? So, in the amendment, it says the necessary security of a free state. It's the right of the state. So, again, what we're seeing is how people read. Amongst us, we have a fair few originalists. I say that with a smile. And with graciousness, hopefully. In a safe environment. We have to be really clear about this issue. Are we focused upon the rights of the individual? We, the persons, we, the individual people, we don't vote by families. We vote as individuals. The states don't vote for the president. The individuals do. And because they put that word people or individual all through these documents, there comes the confusion. The argument that we're having now is the same one they had when they created these documents. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's not that straightforward. So we all know how the argument goes. If they never put the word people in the amendment, you'd only have militia. And the militia is not a vigilante group. We know what a vigilante group is. A vigilante group is a group of people that take the law into their own hands.
it says clearly that the militia is there to protect the state. Therefore, you can't have 10 militias in one state doing their own thing. If the militia is protecting the state, the state must control the militia. Once we get that relationship correct, it becomes simple. Take the word people out, all you've got is state and militia. Now, as soon as you put the word people in, it becomes a confusing or sketchy statement. Because when he speaks about the individual, who's the boss of the individual? Don't say themselves. The household. The household, the family. The property, the farm, the militia is there to protect the state. The individual is there to protect the farm. The state says protect me, the farm says protect me. So when you go to the state level, militia and state, who's going to attack the state? The Federation. Who's going to attack the farm? The state or the Federation? Or some robber, anybody? These are the arguments that both sides have to prove their position. I want us to see this. Hopefully it's clear. If you take the left position, Can some random individual carry a gun? Own a gun, possess a gun. The answer is no. So if it's now the individual protecting their farm. Ten individuals protecting ten farms. A thousand farmers protecting the thousand farms in that state. They all come together and form a militia. So in that case, can individuals bear arms, have weapons? Yes. Now this discussion is not about where those arms are kept and who controls them. It's not that discussion.
So this is the situation with respect to how to view the amendment, the two sides of the argument and the logic that they use. Now, there have been a number of high profile Supreme Court cases that deal with this subject. They go back many, many years. You have some in the 1800s. The 1900s. and our present time. And all of them have made their comment or put their stamp upon their understanding of this Second Amendment. So I'm not going to discuss them, but the four recent ones are 2008, 2010, 2020, and 2022, I think. I think they're the four numbers. So, the last two were to do with New York. Simply, with, I'm not talking about, I'm not going into the state or the city, but we'll just say New York, to put it simply. And... New York has some of the strictest gun control laws, New York City, in the country. And their laws got challenged. So th these are four challenges, the last two specific to New York. that went up to the Supreme Court and they made decisions. And I think we all know at least the, la the latest one, what the answer was or the decision. Which basically says that the reading of the Second Amendment, according to the Supreme Court, it was a majority decision. Do we know what the number was? You should all know what the number was. When it comes to the decision. Good. It was a 6-3 decision. You don't even need to know the news. You just need to know prophecy. And the decision was what? The Second Amendment is dealing with what issue? The militia or the people? Militia or people? People. Therefore, New York lost, basically. I think there's another one that's going to be heard.
or has been heard. I have I did I um I haven't got the details for that because I wasn't going to talk about it, but I just add it in now. So in the original document, the amendment. Does it say? Um, you know, well-regulated militia, uh, the right of the people, etc. When it says the right of the people to to bear arms, to own a gun, what kind of people is that? Does it tell you what kind of people can bear arms? Can a criminal bear arms? Can a violent person bear arms? Can someone who's getting psychological treatment get arms? It doesn't say any of those. Just says people. Now, one of the things about gun control is we all know, I think. Goes something along this argument. If you're mentally ill or you're convicted, we'll say of some really bad crime, we will we will control your gun ownership. So we don't have out of control mentally unwell people having guns. Who thinks that's a bad idea? Is it a bad idea to say anybody can carry guns? Doesn't matter what your mental health is or your criminality. So most people say it's a crazy idea. Problem is are you going to use your idea of what crazy means or are you going to go to the amendment? Are you going to apply common sense or are you going to apply originalism? So you can see the problems that arise. OK, so now we've given some background to all of this. The question that's being asked. So do we have a movement position on bearing arms or possessing firearms? So there was a study that was happening in the Canadian group 
and they were speaking among themselves, asking the question about gun ownership. So there's a slight problem with all of this, of course, because it's not straightforward. Adventists, let's go with Adventism. Do Adventists have a do Adventists have a position on guns? What's our what's what I'll say ask, what's the Adventist position on guns if they have one? Tell me so they don't have one. Go ahead. Say either they don't Adventists don't have a position on guns or that they do have a position and if they do, what is it? Okay, so we've got several arguments now. So if you're a soldier in the military, of course, um, let me not say a soldier. If you're in the military, as an Adventist, can you carry arms? Can you bear arms in the military? OK, so we do have a position then on bearing arms. So I think you'll remember that if you go back to um, the early Adventist history during the Civil War, they had two problems. Well, one of them was the Sabbath and the other one was thou shalt not murder. And centered around all of this issue was the, the problem about bearing arms and killing people. So many Adventists had this idea that it's an Adventist position and therefore it would be a movement position that we would not bear arms. Now, what if you're a farmer? Back in that history, you don't want to join the army um, because you don't want to kill people. Or if you do, if you're conscripted, then you'll take um, a non-combat role, like a medic, for instance. So if you were going to, if you're conscripted to join the army, if you're forced to join the army, you would take a non-combative role like a cook or a medic or something like that. Do all those farmers carry guns? Do they all possess or own guns? We'll go with yes. Whatever they're going to use those guns for, for shooting coyotes or protecting themselves against rattlesnakes, they will all own guns. So you can see straight away, this issue about gun ownership is not that straightforward.
you have the issue about the amendment and its purpose. The issue about joining the military and killing people at war. And protecting your household against a rattlesnake, we'll say. And so depending on the context, you'd come to a decision whether or not you could own a gun. So this is all based upon this idea that you turn the other cheek um, and someone has spoken about the Waldenses um, and their position of non-violence. Adventists have a position on Non-violence, I, I believe that's correct. So knowing all of that, the question arises, are members in the movement I'll use the word allowed. Are we allowed to carry guns, own guns? Or is that against our world view, our prophetic view? So I'm not talking about protection against a wild animal. So we're not we're taking that out of our questioning or out of our equation. We're talking about protection against the most fiercest animal in the world, which is another human. So the question is, do we as a movement have a position on bearing arms or carrying weapons, owning them? Let's say, just say owning weapons. Is it wrong to own a weapon? Or is it okay to do that? Do we all have the liberty and the freedom to buy a gun? So, I think most people have said no. So, everyone who has said no, or you shouldn't carry one, or it's wrong to carry one, or you can, but we really shouldn't. Why do you think it's wrong to have a gun? Why is it wrong? What's the problem with gun ownership? So someone's asked the question, What's the purpose of it? Because it's speaking from the perspective of the amendment, because that's the document that we have. People are not carrying guns to engage in criminal activity. We know that because the amendment says what? 
you carry you have a gun for the security for the security of whatever it is it says state here but it could be your farm or your family but it's it's to do with the security which is about personal or corporate protection. So it's about protection. That's why you have a gun. Some people have basically says it's to do with self-defense. So Gun ownership is not about harming people or hurting people or engaging in criminal activities. It's about protecting, we'll say your property. the inalienable rights of a human being. The right for life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, because property makes you happy. So, People have arguments, and you can see if you're reading the chat, all the arguments that people are having. Which is, is healthy, it's good, I like that. So I'm just checking my timing. So I've, I'm going to go, I'm going to say I've got about uh, five minutes to go. That will be about uh, an hour and 20 minutes I will have had. So I want to summarize where we're at at the moment. We understand hopefully now the Second Amendment and how people view it differently. And now we've moved on from that to talk about our personal right to own a weapon, a gun. For the purpose of self-defense. So I hope we all agree, first of all, that we understand, I should say, that this is a, an American phenomena. It's not a, a global phenomena. But the principle that we can get from this study translates to many spheres of life. So we know that it's, it's legal to own a gun. We know that. So that's not under discussion. The question is, is it morally right to do so, to own a gun? It's legal, but is it moral? We all agree, hopefully, 
that the reason you own a gun is to protect yourself. Is that correct? To protect yourself? Yes or no? Wait for one more answer. OK, people are saying yes, and the answer is no. That militia, what's its purpose? Simba, tell me what the purpose of the militia is. Just type out the answer. Jonathan answered for you. It's to, it's to protect the property. Not to protect itself. Good. So people carry arms not to protect themselves, but to protect what? Not the state, their property. Could be their family, could be the state, whatever you want, they want to define property as, it becomes a much broader idea. but the principle remains intact. So we've used the word possessions, but we're just going to, I, I, I want to stick to the word property, so it's all fixed in our mind. Quiz time. Where did we get the word property from? The person's name. Type it in if you know. No, it's a person's name. Person's name. Where did we get property from? The documents don't say property. It says what? Happiness. Happiness was not the word originally, it was people. Where do we get that from? No, not people, property, property, property. <laughs> Stretch your minds. Not Jefferson, not an American, not France. Good, we'll go with that. John Locke. Okay, so it's the guy from the UK. <laughs> that makes sense. No, not Alan White. <laughs> or the guy from the UK. It was John Locke. Okay, so most people have said because of all of these arguments, it's wrong for the individual to bear arms. That's what the consensus position seems to me from what people have said. Does gun ownership, generally speaking, increase or decrease Increase or decrease violence in society? Increase. We'll go with that. If you own a gun in your family, if you own a gun in your family, is death more likely or less likely to happen in your family because you've got a gun? 
More likely or less likely? More likely, we'll go with that. This is just research. Elder Tess has commented on this several times, I believe. Now, I've said all of this about the left and the right. Um, I've mentioned about increase of gun violence. You've all told me it's wrong. We should turn the other cheek and be nonviolent people. I understand that. That was a bit long. I want to just make a suggestion. What is juxtapositioning? A, a, a simple definition of juxtapositioning. Not just putting two things next to each other. One bit, there's a bit missing from that. Forcing. If it was the north and the south of a ma of two magnets, they're just going to attract to one another. You have to force the things together because they don't want to. They don't want to come together. It looks wrong. Tell me what the two things we're forcing together in our study. Militia and people. Good. We're forcing the militia and the people together. The corporate and the individual are being forced together. Why do we force things together? Why do we force things together? Okay, so people are giving me the standard answer, compare and contrast. That's not going to help us. Okay, so if it's to learn what is right, how do you learn what is right? By forcing things together. Now, not so stop everybody. Uh, let me try to answer before you answer more. You have you build this upon a premise. That one of the things is true or correct. It's right. Now. You have to do your due, diligence, your due diligence to know that. Sheep just wander around doing their own thing. They don't listen. They're blind to their own danger. Is that a fact? Is that the truth? Yes. But you have to demonstrate it. Once you've done that, you're going to juxtapose that forcing two things together. What are the two things you're going to force together? Sheep. 
and type your answers in people good so you're going to force sheep and people together I'll use a, a, a rude word I'm sorry sheep are stupid I don't know about people, but when I juxtapose them, what do I know about people? Type your answers in. People are not smart. They're not smart. Good. They're the same. Okay, so now, what are we juxtaposing in our study? Corporate rights. And individual rights. Now, I think you all say that it's okay to have a militia. You have to fight for your rights. You don't turn the other cheek. When someone comes to do the state harm, you're required to protect it. We have We have plenty of information, 37 books, that prove that, that give you license to kill. As a militia, You have to be careful how you balance that with the 27 books. It says the individual turns the other cheek. OK, stay with me. When Jesus does that. Is Jesus contrasting or comparing? Contrasting or comparing? Quick, I'm running out of time. Contrasting. This is a different. M Militias don't turn the other cheek. They kill the enemy. The individual turns the other cheek and takes the pain. We've been, we've been given the stats, the statistics. Gun ownership increases violence. By the way, if you want to reduce marital violence, what's the easy fix? Reduce marriage. Less marriages, less marriage violence. Okay, that was... Ignore that. Coming back to my study. So, are we going to compare and contrast and juxtapose these two. Yes. What do we know in this study? That the militia 
are allowed to protect themselves. So, contrary to all your reasoning, all your logic, all the brilliant arguments and evidence you have, Despite what anybody and everybody says, blue or red, left or right, you know where this is going. If you're going to juxtapose two things that don't come together, to learn the truth of something that you're not sure about, you carefully and judiciously select an object or a model that you know the answer to and you're confident about. In our case, what is it that we know? Type the word, not sheep, not Bible, militia. We know militia. We chose militia because we know the answer to that. They're allowed to protect their property. The personal is the political. The individual is the corporate. The people are the militia. I know you're not going to like this. What does that tell you about people? Are they allowed to protect their property? Jonathan, what's your answer? Okay, so John, if Jonathan's changed his mind, we're ready to close our study. We'll close with this statement. Yes, based on our logic. We call that methodology. So let me summarize. If you juxtapose, you carefully compare and contrast the individual right to the corporate right. You get some funny answers sometimes. ones that we might not have anticipated. I'll let you think about this. Message me privately. If you agree, start the message with wow. If you don't agree with me, start with, oh no. The close with prayer. Heavenly Father. This is a strange way to address you. When we should know better. 
sometimes things catch us as a surprise. And even though we don't like what we see, even though it may feel wrong, even though the price to pay is high, help us to untangle things. Help us to see things clearly. As we have learnt not to call you Father, through methodology, through comparing and understanding things correctly, as we come to our individual and corporate responsibilities, Help each of us individually to come to a truth. So we can come to an agreed position. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm sorry for going over time. I'll hand you over to your host. Thank you, Elder Perminder. Wow. Blowing us out of the water. Not quite. Uh, and yes, we're uh, about 15 minutes behind, uh, but well worth <laughs> hanging in there. And we were glad that you were able to finish. Uh, remember, everybody, the Zoom is going to be uh, ended and we have to log in again.